Chapter Six of the Film of Fear by Arnold Fredericks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six. Duval's ride back to town with Mrs. Morton and Ruth was quite uneventful. The latter, as she had explained, was ill, weak, indisposed to talk. Duval and Mrs. Morton kept up a brisk conversation upon topics of the day but both knew that it was of the girl they were thinking, and their interest in the subjects they discussed was clearly forced. Both were glad when the car at last stopped before the apartment building, and the long ride was over. Mrs. Morton invited Duval to come in and dine with them, and he promptly accepted. Ruth seemed indifferent. Assisted by her maid, she left the car, and on reaching the apartment, at once went to her room. "'You will excuse me, I know,' she said to Duval. "'I am tired out, and think I had better lie down at once. Nora will bring me some dinner,' she said, turning to her mother. Duval and Mrs. Morton ate their dinner in silence. Some sense of oppression, of impending evil, hung over them both. Mrs. Morton left the table toward the close of the meal and went to her daughter's room. With the solicitude of the typical mother, she arranged the windows. That opening to the fire escape she raised to its full height. The one facing upon the court she left as it was, raised some six or eight inches. Then, having kissed her daughter good night, she returned to the library, where Duval sat smoking a cigar. Ruth has gone to bed, she told him. Both of the windows in her room are open, the one on the fire escape wide, the other partially raised. Duval looked at her with an expression of doubt. I think it would be better for the present, he said, to close and fasten the one opening on the fire escape. We cannot tell to what danger your daughter may be exposed. Mrs. Morton rose and left the room. I will do as you advise, she said. Going to Ruth's bedroom, she closed and fastened the window in question. Then she went back to the library. Have you hit upon any theory to account for the sending of the letters? She asked. Duval shook his head. The whole thing is very mysterious, he said. Of course, it was easy enough for anyone to leave the photograph at the studio this afternoon. In fact, it might readily have been done by one of the other actresses who might be jealous of your daughter's success but if the thing was done by anyone employed at the studio how can we account for the message left in the bedroom at half past nine this morning the one we found on the floor if the woman who was responsible for these threats was at the studio this morning how could she arrange to have the note left in your daughter's bedroom here at the same hour? That would seem to imply a confederate. I confess that the entire matter is, for the moment, beyond me. Were you able to find out anything concerning the telegram which came this morning? Nothing, except that it was sent by a woman i was not surprised to learn that naturally i should expect that a woman was responsible for these threats but what woman that is the question he sat for a long time thinking his eyes fixed upon the floor suddenly there came a ring at the doorbell mrs morton without waiting for the maid sprang to the hall with duval close at her heels as she threw it open, they saw a man standing in the doorway. Duval was the first to recognize their caller. "'Oh, how do you do, Mr. Baker?' he said, holding out his hand. Mr. Baker came in and greeted Mrs. Morton. "'I didn't expect to find Mr. Duval here,' he said. "'In fact, I came to you to get his hotel address. Luckily, I won't need it now.' "'Anything new?' Duval asked as they returned to the library. Nothing much. I got those samples of the writing of the various typewriters, as you requested, Baker replied, 
and I thought that instead of waiting until tomorrow it would be better to bring them to you tonight. He took a sheaf of papers from his pocket. There are thirty-two in all. What are you going to do with them? He placed the papers in Duval's hand. The latter sat down at the library table and placed the sheets of paper before him. Of course you know, he said to Baker, that every typewriting machine has its unmistakable peculiarities. It is almost impossible to find a machine that has been used at all, that has not developed certain individual defects or qualities found in no other machine. Now let us take, for instance, the letters that Miss Morton has received during the past few days. They have all been written on the same machine, and I am of the opinion that it is a fairly old one. While going out to the studio this afternoon, I worked out and wrote down in my notebook the particular features which appear in all these letters. He took a small leather-covered book from his pocket. In the first place, he said, the letter A throughout the several communications is always found to be out of line. The key bar is doubtless a trifle bent. Let us therefore see if in any of the samples you have brought me there exists a similar defect. He took the samples of writing one by one, and after scrutinizing them carefully, passed them over to Baker, who likewise subjected them to a critical examination. When their work was completed, it was found that, of the thirty-two samples, the displacement of the letter A occurred in but three, and in one of these it was so slight as to be scarcely noticeable. Duval laid the three pages to one side. A second fault shown in the typewriting of these letters, he said, is to be found in the capital W. Its lower right-hand corner has been worn or broken off, so that it invariably fails to register. He handed one of the letters to Baker. See here and here. The corner of the W instead of being clear and distinct, is blunt and defective. Let us see whether a similar fault is to be found on any one of these three samples. He picked up the three sheets of paper that he had placed to one side. As he examined them, Mr. Baker and Mrs. Morton saw a shadow of disappointment cross his face. He handed the three pages to Baker. The threatening letters were not written on any machine at your studio, he said. Baker took the pages and looked them over carefully. No, he said at length. You are right. None of these show the second defect you have named. Well, observed Duval cheerfully, we have accomplished something at least. We know that these letters were not written at the studio and it seems reasonably certain that the woman we are looking for has a typewriter in her rooms, or wherever she may live. Of course, she might have had the typewriting done by some public stenographer, but I consider it unlikely. A person sending threats of this character would not be apt to entrust so dangerous a secret to a third person. We must, therefore, Make up our minds to find a woman who has a typewriting machine and knows how to use it. There are probably a hundred thousand such women in New York, Baker observed gloomily. No doubt, but we have more information than that about the person who sent these letters. What? asked Baker and Mrs. Morton in a breath. Well, in the first place, this woman was able to secure possession of a photograph of Miss Morton. He took the hideously distorted picture from his pocket. Do either of you know where this photograph was made? Mrs. Morton examined the picture with a shudder. Then she rose, went to a cabinet at the other end of the room, and took out an album. 
Returning to the table, she placed the book before her, and began to turn the pages. In a few moments she found what she was looking for, a duplicate of the likeness which lay before them, with the exception, of course, of its frightful distortions. This picture was made by Gibson on Fifth Avenue, she said, referring to the photograph in the book. Both Baker and Duval saw at once that on the retouched picture the name of the photographer had been scratched off. How many of them were made, and what became of them? Duval asked quickly. Ordinarily I would not answer such a question, Mrs. Morton replied, for Ruth has had many photographs taken, and we have not, of course, kept a record of them, or what has become of them, but in this particular case I happen to remember that she did not like the pose particularly, and ordered but half a dozen. I do not think she gave any of them away. If I am right in my supposition, there should be but five more in the apartment. Closing the book, Mrs. Morton went to the cabinet again, and took out a portfolio containing numberless photographs of her daughter, in all sorts of poses. After some searching, she produced a brown paper envelope, containing a number of pictures, all taken by the same photographer at the same time. There were in the envelope four copies of the photograph, the fifth of which was contained in the album. Evidently one has been given away, Duval exclaimed. Now if we can find out to whom, our search for the writer of these letters may be very quickly ended. Mr. Baker regarded them both with a puzzled look. I have seen that picture before, he said and of course I could not have done so had I not seen the one that is missing. He sat for a while in silence, searching his recollection for a solution of the problem. Suddenly he spoke. There was a picture like that in my office at one time, he exclaimed. Miss Morton sent a number down for advertising purposes, and I am positive that this one was among them. I remember distinctly the pose of the head, the unusual arrangement of the hair. That photograph should be in our files. The fact that it has been taken out shows that the person who has been writing these letters is a member of our own staff, or at least has access to our files. That does not necessarily follow, observed Duval. Why not? Because the picture might have been obtained from the photographer. But they are not allowed to dispose of the portraits of others without the sitter's permission. I know that, but they sometimes do, especially in the case of any one so well known as Miss Morton. She has become a sort of public character. Well, remarked Duval, we can readily find out in the morning. You, Mr. Baker, can you go through your files, and should you find the photograph to be there, I will take the matter up with the photographer if on the contrary the picture is missing it will be fairly conclusive evidence that the person or persons we are looking for are in some way connected with the studio i will make an investigation the first thing in the morning mr baker announced rising do you expect to be at the studio early mr duval yes uh, quite early then we had best leave matters until then good night Good night, Mrs. Morton. He turned and started toward the door. He had proceeded but a few steps when the three occupants of the room were startled by a series of sudden and agonizing cries. From the rear of the apartment came a succession of screams, so piercing in their intensity, so filled with horror, that they found themselves for a moment unable to stir. Then Mrs. Morton gave a cry of anguish and darted out into the hall, closely followed by Duval and Mr. Baker. The screams continued, filling the entire apartment with their clamor. That the voice which uttered them was that of Ruth Morton, none of the three doubted for a moment. With sinking hearts they went on, prepared for the worst. Duval found himself dreading the moment when they should reach the bedroom door and face the girl, her beauty perhaps disfigured beyond all recognition. 
there was a sharp turn at the end of the hall into a shorter cross hall at the end of which was the door of ruth's bedroom it was closed but as though in response to mrs morton's agonized appeals it suddenly opened as they reached it and ruth morton pale as death appeared with wide open eyes staring straight ahead she half stepped half fell through the doorway her slender figure clothed only in her nightdress mrs morton screamed as she caught sight of her daughter the girl tried to say something but her tongue failed her then with a faint moan she lurched forward and fell limply into her mother's arms end of chapter six chapter seven of the film of fear by arnold fredericks this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven when duval mr baker of the motion picture company and mrs morton rushed down the hallway of the latter's apartment in response to the screams from ruth's bedroom they were one and all convinced that the girl had suffered some terrible injury that the mysterious threats to destroy her beauty which had been made during the past few days had been converted into some frightful reality one glance at the girl's white face as she fell fainting into her mother's arms told the detective that their fears had been to that extent at least groundless the girl's lovely features although drawn and contorted by fear showed no signs of the disfigurement they feared leaving the girl to her mother's care duval closely followed by baker dashed into the bedroom and at once switched on the lights the place to the intense surprise of both presented a picture of perfect quiet and order the bed clothing was slightly disarranged but this of course was but natural since ruth had sprung up under the influence of some terrible fear and rushed from the room everything else seemed in its place duval's first act was to examine the window the one fronting on the fire escape was closed and tightly fastened it was perfectly clear that no one had entered the room in that way the other window facing on the court was raised a few inches just as mrs morton had left it half an hour before duval turned to his companion with a puzzled frown i had supposed mr baker he said that someone had entered this room and frightened miss morton while she was asleep but that is impossible the windows have not been disturbed baker glanced at the one which faced the court that one may have been he said indicating it with a nod some one may have come in that way raising the window to effect an entrance and lowering it again after leaving i admit that what you say would be possible were there any way in which the window might be reached from outside duval replied but if you will look out and tell me how any one can make an entrance from the court i will agree to the possibility you suggest baker raised the window and glanced out the apartment above duval went on is unoccupied and the window above is closed and fastened the little attic in the adjoining house is unused although that is not important since no one can reach the window from it in any event can you suggest any other way mr baker shook his head she must have been frightened by some terrible nightmare he said i do not wonder at it she has gone through enough to upset anybody's nerves suppose we go back and question her just a moment exclaimed duval then he dropped upon his knees beside the disordered bed and began to examine the surface of the counterpane with minute care what is it baker asked joining him i don't know yet returned duval as he took a magnifying glass from his pocket and proceeded to scrutinize with the greatest interest some marks upon the counterpane's surface presently he rose 
replaced the glass in his pocket and turned to his companion there is something very astonishing about this whole affair he exclaimed what do you make of those he indicated a series of dark smudges upon the bedspread arranged in little groups baker bent over and examined the marks with an exclamation of surprise why they look like fingerprints he cried large fingerprints it is impossible to say whether they are fingerprints or not duval replied as you see there are a great many of them very confusingly arranged but there is something else that you have not noticed what do you suppose could have made a mark like this he pointed to a long straight dark line which extended halfway across the counterpane and pointed directly toward the window which faced upon the court the line was very faint but clearly defined as though someone had laid a thin dusty stick across the bed i can't make anything of it baker exclaimed gazing toward the window nor can i said duval at one time because of certain indentations on the letters found in this room i had thought that they might have been introduced through the partly opened window by means of a long rod a fishing pole perhaps this mark on the counterpane appears to bear out that theory the smudges which look like fingerprints may have been merely the points at which the end of the pole or whatever was attached to the end of the pole came in contact with the bed all that is perfectly supposable but you can see for yourself that if a long pole were thrust through the window raised as the ladder was but a trifle above the level of the bed the other end of such a pole must of necessity have been held at approximately the same level and the only point outside the window from which it could have been held is in the air forty feet above the bottom of the court the thing is absurd there is of course the window of the apartment below baker suggested might not it have been used i thought of that duval replied you can see for yourself that even a tall man standing on the window sill below would find not only his hands but even his head far below the sill of this window nor could anyone so support themselves without something to hold on to but all this is beside the question the people in the apartment below are friends of mrs morton's a middle-aged man and his wife with two young children they are eminently respectable people and quite above suspicion then i give the thing up exclaimed baker suppose we have a talk with miss morton they found the girl lying on a couch in the library with her mother sitting beside her she seemed very weak and quiet but in full possession of her faculties duval drew up a chair and asked her if she felt able to tell them what had occurred yes she replied in a faint voice her face still showing evidences of her fright i will try to tell you exactly what happened i had taken some medicine to make me sleep before i got into bed because i was very nervous and upset when mother came back to fix the windows i was already drowsy and just remember that she turned out the lights and then i must have dozed all of a sudden i heard a strange rasping noise and i woke up with a feeling that there was someone in the room i don't know just why i felt so sure of that whether it was merely a sense of someone's presence or the sound of someone moving about near my bed i think however that it was the latter the room was dark of course but enough light came through the windows to make a moving object distinguishable i looked about terribly frightened but for a moment i saw nothing the noise i had heard at first continued then without the least warning a hand seemed to clutch at the bedclothes and i saw above me bending over me a terrible dark face exactly like the grinning death's head on those letters i've been getting 
I lay perfectly still, frozen with horror, and in a moment the face had disappeared, and then I began to scream. Right after that I sprang from the bed and threw open the door, and found Mother and Mr. Baker and yourself standing in the hall. That is all I know. Duval looked at her for a moment, puzzled. Are you sure you really saw someone leaning over you? Might it not have been an illusion, the result of your nervous condition? No, I am certain someone was there. Someone quite tall, I should say, and with a terrible, evil face. It might have been a mask, of course, Duval suggested. Someone wearing a mask? Yes, it might have been. It was too dark for me to tell, of course, but I remember the eyes, for I saw them distinctly. They were only a few inches from my own. She put her hands to her face and shuddered. It was terrible, terrible. I shall never sleep in that room again. There, there, dearie, Mrs. Morton whispered in a soothing voice. You need not sleep there. You can lie right here for the rest of the night, and I will stay with you and see that no one harms you. That would be best, Mrs. Morton, Duval remarked. And tomorrow I suggest that you and your daughter move, temporarily at least, to another location, some quiet hotel, where you will not be subject to these terrible annoyances. I cannot imagine how it is done, but in some way, some almost superhuman way, it seems, someone can apparently either enter your daughter's room or at least reach it from without at will what do you mean by that asked ruth somewhat mystified i mean this miss morton i do not believe that there was anyone in your room tonight i do not believe that there has ever been anyone there but i do believe that the two letters we found there were introduced from without in some mysterious way at the end of a long pole or rod and i think that what frightened you so tonight was merely a mask a grotesque representation of the seal used on the letters and pushed towards you in some way as you lay in bed for the purpose of terrifying you. But why? Why? The girl cried. I cannot say. But it has occurred to me that these people, whoever they are, that are trying to injure you, may not intend any physical violence at all, at least for the present, but may be depending solely upon the terrible and insidious power of suggestion you must bear this possibility in mind and try to control your fears i can readily believe that thirty days of this sort of persecution and you would be a physical and mental wreck but we shall stop it you need have no fears on that score mrs morton turned to her daughter with a few words of explanation Mr. Richards, or rather, Mr. Duval, is not a newspaper man, Ruth, but a detective, who is trying to bring the wretches who are annoying you to justice. I feel every confidence in him. Ruth turned toward Duval a very white and pathetic face. I hope you will succeed, Mr. Duval, she said in a weak voice. I cannot stand much more. I shall, Miss Morton and now he turned to mr baker i think we had better go and let miss morton get some rest i will come here in the morning mrs morton he continued addressing the girl's mother and we will consider further the question of your moving to a hotel meanwhile i do not think you have anything further to fear this evening good night before leaving the apartment he made another examination of the marks upon the bedclothes then closed and fastened both windows and locked the door of the room mr baker left him at the corner 
you will come to the studio tomorrow of course by all means i shall come down with miss morton and her mother that will give us an opportunity to investigate further the matter of the missing photograph and also to talk over that plan i had in mind concerning the new film you are to show at the grand tomorrow night it is barely possible that by means of a plan i have in mind we may be able to locate the person or persons responsible for all this trouble i certainly hope so said baker as he took his leave this thing is getting on my nerves too duval made his way back to his hotel as much mystified as ever he had thought for a moment of spending the night on the sidewalk in front of the morton's apartment watching the windows facing on the court but his experience told him that it would be useless the alarm which ruth had made the closing of the windows of her bedroom the locking of the door all made it highly improbable that any further attempt would be made to annoy her during the night he walked along in a state of intense preoccupation trying to discover some reasonable explanation of the astonishing events of the day once he had an impression a feeling that he was being followed but when he turned around there was no one in sight but a slightly tipsy man and a couple of young girls far down the street he dismissed the thought from his mind and proceeded to his hotel it was not yet eleven o'clock and grace was waiting for him in the little parlor of their suite well richard she remarked as he came in you've had quite a day of it <sighs> yes quite he replied throwing himself into a chair what have you been doing with yourself shopping mostly i found it rather dull i went to a moving picture this afternoon saw your friend ruth morton she certainly is a very beautiful girl yes very duval replied absently have you seen her today grace went on with a smile yes why oh nothing i was just thinking duval burst into a laugh and rising went over to his wife and kissed her for heaven's sake grace he said i'm not interested in motion picture actresses you weren't i'll admit nor in motion pictures either until recently but perhaps you have changed i could understand any man being fascinated by a girl like ruth morton duval did not pursue the question it was a hard and fast rule between them not to discuss his professional work and mrs morton had made it a point that he should confide in no one not even his wife well he said picking up an evening paper i'm not fascinated yet no letters for me today i suppose none grace went on with her sewing they sat for a while in silence presently there came a knock on the door and a boy appeared bearing a telegram Duval opened it carelessly, thinking it some word from the overseer of his farm. He sat up with sudden astonishment as he read the contents of the message. Keep out, the telegram read, or you will find that we can strike back. Duval placed the telegram in his pocket with a frown. So it appeared that, in spite of all his care, his connection with the case was known how this was possible he could not imagine his first visit to the morton apartment that day had been in the guise of a workman his subsequent appearance at the studio and later at the apartment had been in the character of a newspaper man there was only one explanation someone had watched him while he was making his examination of ruth morton's room and subsequently had followed him from the apartment to his hotel he began to realize that he was dealing with a shrewd brain and one that acted with almost uncanny quickness and precision he determined that if mrs morton and her daughter changed their place of residence the following day he would do the same he said nothing of his intentions to grace however it was more than ever necessary that he preserve secrecy in this case 
No bad news, I hope, Richard. Grace remarked, glancing up from her sewing. No, nothing serious. Have you heard anything from home? Yes, everything is going along quite smoothly. The boy is well and happy, and Mrs. Preston says to stay as long as we want to. Well, said Duval, rising and throwing down his newspaper, if things don't go better than they have been going today, I may have to be here for some time. I've got a queer case on, Grace. I'd like to tell you about it, but I can't. But it is quite unusual. Some features to it that I have never met before. Oh, I wish I might help you, Grace exclaimed. You know how often I have done so in the past. I know, dear. But I am bound to secrecy, for the present at least. Suppose we turn in now. I've got to get up early. All right, Grace said. But if you need my help, don't hesitate to ask me. To tell you the truth, I'm having an awfully slow time. End of chapter 7「Of the Film of Fear」by Arnold Fredericks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Duval made his appearance at the Morton apartment the following morning in his ordinary guise. It was his intention, when the time came, to disappear from the case in his normal person, to reappear in it later in a complete disguise but that time, he felt, had not yet arrived. Mrs. Morton received him in fairly good spirits. Her daughter, she said, had had a restful night, in spite of her terrible experience. When Ruth rose from the breakfast-table to greet him, he was gratified to find that she showed no great traces of the fright of the evening before. "'I'm feeling almost myself again, Mr. Duval," she said. "'I've made up my mind not to let these people frighten me again.' Nothing further occurred last night, of course, Duval asked. Nothing, replied Mrs. Morton. I could almost believe the whole thing a horrible dream. They did not touch on the question of going to a hotel during the short interval that elapsed before they set out for the studio. Duval was anxious to see Mr. Baker. He hoped sincerely that by means of the photograph which had been in the company's files, some trace of the persons responsible for the threats might be obtained. The trip to the studio was made most uneventfully, and Ruth started in with her work in very good spirits. Duval, leaving the girl with her mother, sought out Mr. Baker in the latter's private office. Hello! Baker cried, grasping the detective's hand warmly. Anything new? <sighs> Not a thing. How about the photograph we were going to trace? Mr. Baker frowned. It's a curious thing, he replied. Most curious. The picture in question was, I find, taken from the files by Mr. Moore, our president, and placed on his desk. He always admired it and kept it there, along with a number of others, to show to persons calling upon him. Now, it seems, it has disappeared. There is not the slightest trace of it. But, Duval objected, who could have taken it? A dozen people, half a hundred, I guess. You see, Mr. Moore's office is a big room, just beyond here. He rose and led the detective through a short corridor. Here it is. He went on, throwing open the door. This is where Mr. Moore receives his callers. It is his reception room, and no private papers are kept here. Those are all in the smaller office adjoining. This room is open at any time, after Mr. Moore leaves in the evening, and he often leaves early. Anyone might come in here. And when the offices are closed at night, I suppose any employee of the company might look in, if he cared to do so, without anyone objecting. You see, this is sort of a public room. The inner office is always kept locked, but there has never seemed to be any good reason for locking this one. Still, although you cannot tell who has taken the picture, it seems clear enough that it must have been removed by someone employed in the studio. 
Even that is by no means certain. So many people come here every day. All sorts of visitors, writers, actors, and the like. After business hours, I don't doubt any number of persons enter this room to look at the pictures of our great successes that hang on its walls. And then there are the caretakers, the scrub women, and their friends. I find that they, many of them, bring in outsiders after working hours to look at the studio and the famous offices. Of course it should not be, and it will not be in the future, but up to now we have rather welcomed people from outside. It seemed good advertising. Duval followed his companion back to his office. Then this clue, like all the others in this singular case, he remarked, seems to end in a blind alley. It seems so, assented Mr. Baker gloomily. What was your plan about the new film we're going to show tonight? Duval was about to speak, but before he could do so, they heard a slight commotion in the hall outside. Then someone rapped violently on the door. Both he and Baker sprang to their feet. Come in, the latter cried. The door was flung open, and Mr. Edwards, the director, who was making the picture upon which Ruth Morton was working, strode hastily into the room. Mr. Baker, he exclaimed, then paused upon seeing Duval. What is it? Baker replied. Will you look here a minute, please? Baker went up to him, his face showing the greatest uneasiness. What's the matter? he asked. Anything wrong? Yes. Miss Morton was going through the scene in the first part where she gets the telegram, you know, and when she opened the message and read it, she fainted. Fainted? What was in the telegram to make her faint? Well, it ought to have read, We'll call for you tonight with marriage license, Jimmy. That was the prop message we had prepared. But somebody must have substituted another one for it. This is what she read. He handed Baker a yellow slip of paper. I can't make anything out of it. Baker snatched the telegram from his hand with a growl of rage and read it hastily. Then he passed it over to Duval. What do you think of that? he asked. Duval gazed at the telegram with a feeling of helpless anger. Twenty-six days more, it read. When you appear in your new picture at the Grand tonight, it will be your last. I shall be there. The grinning death's head seal was appended in lieu of a signature, as before. A feeling of resentment swept over the detective. It seemed that these people acted as they saw fit, with supreme indifference to the fact that he was on their trail. Never before had he felt his skill so flouted, his ability made so light of. And yet, as usual, the message had apparently been delivered in such a way as to make tracing it impossible. Still at it, it seems, Mr. Baker remarked. This thing has got to stop, and at once. I don't propose to let anybody make a monkey out of me. Duval turned to the director, Mr. Edwards. Who prepared the original telegram? He asked quickly. Mr. Edwards looked at the detective in surprise, evidently wondering what this stranger had to do with the matter. Answer, Edwards. It's all right, snapped Mr. Baker. I prepared the property telegram. When? Last night. I knew it would be needed today. What did you do with it? I left it on my desk. This morning I took it into the studio, and when the moment arrived, I gave it to the actor who took it to Miss Morton. Was he out of your sight after you gave him the telegram? No. He took it and walked right on the scene. Then he couldn't have substituted another for it. No. It would have been impossible unless he used sleight of hand. Before you gave the man the telegram, where was it? In my coat pocket. No chance, I suppose, of anyone having taken it out and substituting another. None. Then it is clear that the substitution must have been effected between the time you left your office last night and your arrival here this morning. Yes. Was this possible? Undoubtedly. I left my office last night about six. It is never locked. 
The caretakers, the women who clean the offices, were in there later. And from seven to nine this morning, it would also have been a simple matter for anyone to enter and make the change. Duval turned to Mr. Baker. It's the same story, he said. Someone who works in the building is responsible for this thing, or else is able to bribe one or more of your employees to act for them. But we won't get very far looking for the guilty person, with several hundred people to watch and no clues whatever to go on. Suppose we go back to your office, and I will tell you what I had in mind about this evening. Is Miss Morton able to go on with the scene? Baker asked as Edwards started away. No, she seems all broken up. I don't think she is very well. Her mother is going to take her home as soon as she feels better. Will you ask Mrs. Morton to wait a little while, Mr. Edwards? Tell her that Mr. Duval will join her presently and go back to the city with her. Mr. Edwards nodded and withdrew, and Duval and Mr. Baker retired to the latter's private office. What did you have in mind about that new film we're going to release tonight? Mr. Baker asked. I'll explain that presently. First, tell me how long it will take you to make a short section of film. Say enough to show for about ten seconds? Oh, not long. But what of? I'll explain that presently. But you could make a section of film, develop and print it, and insert it in the picture you are going to show tonight, if you had to. Couldn't you? Yes, if we had to. But what's the idea? Duval took a bit of paper from his pocket and handed it to Baker. I want you to make a picture of this, and have it inserted into the film at any convenient point, say, at the beginning of the second part, and you had better have the cutting and pasting in done by some trusted person under your personal supervision. But, said Baker, gazing in amazement at the bit of paper Duval had handed him, what's the idea of putting this in our picture? It wouldn't do at all. Look at that telegram Mr. Edwards gave you. The writer says in it, I shall be there. Now, if the person who is causing all this trouble is going to be in the audience at the Grand Theatre tonight, it is our business to find her. I say her because I am convinced the guilty person is a woman. A look of comprehension began to dawn upon Mr. Baker's face. By George! he exclaimed. You figure out that this will cause her to disclose herself? Make some sign? I feel certain of it. Then we will put it in. He laid the square of paper on his desk. I will have a section of the film made privately and at once. I shall not tell even the other officers of the company about it. I suppose they will give me the devil, until after they know the reasons for it. But then, of course, it will be all right. Duval rose and put out his hand. You will be there tonight, of course? Of course. And you? Oh, I'll be on hand all right, although you may not recognize me. Good day. With a quick handshake he left the room and went to look for Ruth and her mother. He found them in the girls' dressing room ready to depart. Ruth was pale and terrified, showing the most intense nervousness in every word and movement. Mrs. Morton, scarcely less affected, strove with all her power to remain calm, in order that her daughter might not break down completely. Duval did his best to cheer them up. You must not let this thing prey on your mind, Miss Morton, he said. We are going to put a stop to it, and that very soon. I hope so, Mr. Duval, the girl replied. If you don't, I'm afraid I, I shall break down completely. I think we had better go home at once, Mrs. Morton said. Ruth is in no condition to do any more work today. I quite agree with you about going, Mrs. Morton, but not home. He lowered his voice as though fearing that even at that moment some tool of the woman who was sending the letters might be within earshot. 
i suggest that you let me take your daughter to some quiet hotel you can follow with her maid and the necessary baggage later on but we must be certain to make the change in such a way that our enemies who are undoubtedly watching us will not know of it we will all leave here in your car giving out that we are going to your home no one will suspect anything to the contrary on our arrival in the city your daughter and i will leave the car and drive to the hotel in a taxicab when later on you follow with the baggage take a taxi sending your own car to the garage i know your confidence in your chauffeur but in this affair we can afford to trust no one your daughter and yourself can remain quietly in the hotel under an assumed name for a few days until she recovers her strength meanwhile i have every expectation that the persons at the bottom of this shameful affair will have been caught the plan appealed to mrs morton at once and she told the detective so but where shall we go to what hotel she asked duval leaned over and whispered in her ear the name of an exclusive and very quiet hotel in the upper part of the city do not mention the name to any one he said not even the taxicab driver when you leave the house tell him to put you down at the corner a block away and do not proceed to the hotel until you see that he has driven off and keep your eyes on your maid i do not suspect her i admit but there seems to be a leak somewhere and we must stop it mrs morton nodded and rose we had better start then she said i understand perfectly have ruth register in the name of bradley and i think mr duval if you can do so you had better arrange to stop there as well i had intended to do so the detective replied that will be better mrs morton led the way to the street you did not intend to go to the showing of your new film at the grand tonight did you duval asked ruth after they had started away from the studio yes i had intended to go she replied i always go to my first releases but tonight i do not feel able to do so i think it is just as well what you need most now is rest the girl looked at herself in a small mirror affixed to the side of the car oh she exclaimed i look terrible these people are right it seems three more weeks of this persecution and my looks would be quite gone mr edwards told me only this morning that he had never seen me look so bad there were tears in her eyes duval realized that she spoke the truth the effect of the strain upon her nervous system the brutal shocks of the past two days the horror of the experience of the night before had wrought havoc with the girl's beauty her face gray lined haggard her eyes heavy and drawn made her the very opposite of the radiant creature that had created such a furor in motion picture circles the methods of her persecutors if unchecked would beyond doubt wreck her strength and health in a short time and in addition there was the danger that at any moment a physical attack a swiftly thrown acid bomb an explosive mixture concealed in an innocent-looking package might destroy both her beauty and her reason in one blinding flash with the fear in her great brown eyes constantly before him duval determined more than ever to free her from this terrible persecution they separated in the neighborhood of thirtieth street duval and miss morton taking a taxicab that stood before one of the smaller fifth avenue hotels he made a pretense of entering the hotel and did not summon the taxi until mrs morton's car was well out of sight up the avenue then he instructed the driver to proceed first to his hotel their stop here was but momentary 
Duval went to his room, threw a few articles of clothing into his grip, left a note for Grace, telling her that he would be absent for several days, then rejoined his companion, and drove uptown to the hotel opposite the park, the name of which he had mentioned to Mrs. Morton. He felt perfectly certain that they had not been followed. Upon arriving at the hotel, he entered their names, including that of Mrs. Morton, upon the register, using the pseudonym which that latter had suggested. Then, sending Ruth to her room, he asked to see the manager, and had a brief conference with him in private. Immediately thereafter, he went up to his own apartment. As he had arranged, it adjoined the suite selected for the Mortons. He tapped lightly on the communicating door. "'Are you all right, Miss Morton?' he called. "'Yes,' came the girl's voice from the opposite side. "'All right, thank you.' End of chapter 8nine of the film of fear by arnold fredericks this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine grace duval said good-bye to her husband that morning with very little enthusiasm she was not jealous of him she was too sensible a woman and trusted him too fully for that but his sudden interest in ruth morton the charming motion picture star seemed rather incomprehensible to her. Of course, she suspected he was working on a case which concerned the girl, although Duval had neither affirmed nor denied it. But she felt lonely, and perhaps a trifle out of sorts, and found her solitary breakfasts, luncheons, dinners, a little trying. So often before, she and Richard had worked together. Why, she wondered, did he so pointedly exclude her from this case? She would have liked to talk it over with him. She sat rather disconsolately in her room most of the forenoon, and about one o'clock made ready for a lonely luncheon. She was just about to leave the apartment when the telephone bell rang. Grace hastened to it at once, hoping that the call might be from her husband. A woman's voice, low, firm, determined, sounded in her ears. I want to speak with Mr. Duval. The voice said, Mr. Duval is out. This is Mrs. Duval. Very well, Mrs. Duval. If you want to keep your husband from very serious harm, you had better tell him to steer clear of Ruth Morton's affairs in future. A word to the wise, you know. Good day. The speaker suddenly rang off. Grace turned from the telephone, her brain in a whirl. What danger threatened her husband? Ought she not to tell him of the message as soon as possible, so that he might be on his guard? And what did this mysterious reference to Ruth Morton's affairs mean? Did it imply that Richard was in any way involved? But that was preposterous. She put the thought from her mind, and went down in the elevator to a lonely and not very enjoyable meal. As she left the dining-room and passed through the lobby, she thought she saw ahead of her a familiar figure. A moment later she realized that it was Richard himself, walking very rapidly toward the main entrance, his satchel in his hand. Was he leaving the hotel? and if so, ought she not to make an attempt to give him the message she had just received, before he did so? She walked quickly after him, but his pace was so rapid that she reached the sidewalk only in time to see him swing himself into a waiting taxi, baggage in hand, and drive quickly off. But what Grace saw, in addition to this, filled her with queer misgivings, Beside her husband in the cab was a woman, very beautiful woman, whom Grace had no difficulty whatever in identifying as Ruth Morton, and she also noticed, in the brief moment that elapsed before the taxi shot toward the avenue, that the woman seemed to be in tears, and that Richard leaned over with the utmost solicitude and affection, and clasped her hand in his. For the first time in her life, 
grace duval was actually jealous thoughts of possible danger to her husband however were paramount in her mind without an instant's hesitation she stepped into a second taxi whose driver was trying to attract her attention and told him to follow the car containing the man and woman which had just driven off the chauffeur grinned knowingly nodded and started his car his grin drove from grace's mind her sudden and unaccustomed jealousy she knew that richard must be going away with this girl for some reason connected with his professional work of course that work did not usually include consoling beautiful damsels in distress but there must be extenuating circumstances she put her unpleasant thoughts from her mind and proceeded on her mission to give her husband the warning message she had just received with a reasonably calm mind after a drive of some fifteen minutes she saw the cab ahead of them begin to slow up and observed that her chauffeur did likewise presently the first cab stopped before the doors of a big imposing-looking hotel and richard and miss morton hurriedly entered grace did not at once get out she knew that her husband might resent her having followed him and did not care to put him to any disadvantage by appearing so unexpectedly upon the scene she waited therefore for several minutes until he would have had time to go to his room and then paying off her cabman she strolled quietly into the hotel lobby there were a few persons sitting about but richard was not amongst them going to the clerk at the desk she asked to see mr richard duval the clerk regarded her with a supercilious stare consulted his records in a bored way then informed her that no such person was registered there grace was completely taken aback but i saw him come in only a few moments ago she protested no such person here miss with a frigid smile the clerk turned away watching her however out of the corner of his eye as though he considered her a suspicious character grace leaned over and examined the register there were three entries upon it in a handwriting clearly that of her husband mrs bradley and maid the first entry said miss bradley the second they had been assigned a suite of rooms the third and last entry was john bradley his room adjoined the suite all three were set down as hailing from boston grace puzzled for a long time over this mysterious series of entries without arriving at any definite conclusion regarding them where was the so-called mrs bradley and why had her husband assumed the same name was he posing as ruth morton's brother and if so for what reason she could not make head or tail of the matter and wondered whether she had better send up her card or write richard a note and leave it for him telling of the warning while she was debating the matter in her mind she suddenly saw him emerge from one of the elevators at the opposite side of the lobby and come toward the desk grace approached him at once glad that the matter had been so simply arranged richard she said in a low voice i want to speak to you the gentleman she had addressed regarded her with a frown my name is not richard madam he said pointedly i am john bradley you must have made a mistake with a polite bow he passed on grace was completely taken aback she knew that between them there existed a tacit understanding never to address each other in public during the progress of a case unless requested to do so by some sign but she felt that she had important information to give her husband and then she had been a trifle jealous and annoyed the thought that she had committed an error filled her with chagrin without a word she left the hotel at a nearby corner she stepped into a telephone booth and calling up the hotel asked to speak to mr john bradley 
in a few moments she heard richard's familiar tones this is grace she said quickly i'm sorry i spoke to you just now but i wanted to tell you that some woman telephoned the hotel today and left a warning to the effect that if you did not keep out of miss morton's affairs you would be in serious danger how did you know where i was duval asked i saw you leave the hotel and followed you you should not have done so but i wanted to give you the message i thought you ought to know hope that no harm will come of it but how could harm come of it you drove here in one of the hotel's regular cabs i suppose yes that the people i am trying to avoid may trace me here through the driver of that cab oh richard i'm so sorry isn't there anything i can do <sighs> nothing now except to make no further attempt to communicate with me here grace returned to her hotel very thoroughly dissatisfied with what she had done it seemed to her that by trying to warn richard of possible danger she might only have brought it upon him apparently he had left their hotel to avoid the very persons who had telephoned the warning message to her she arrived at the door got out of the cab in which she had made the journey and looked about hoping that the cabman who had driven her uptown might now be at his usual stand. To her delight she saw that he was. She went up to the man, a slim, keen-looking young Irishman, and engaged him in conversation. "'Do you remember driving me uptown an hour or so ago?' she asked. "'Sure I do, miss,' answered the man, touching his cap. "'Then please forget completely where you went, will you?' she handed the man a ten-dollar bill it is barely possible that someone may try to find out through you where i went be sure that you give them no information they'll get nothing out of me miss the man replied pocketing the bill with a pleased grin and if anybody does try to find out get their name if you can and if not a description of them i'll do my best miss i am stopping here my name is duval mrs duval very good ma'am i'll attend to it ma'am grace went up to her room satisfied that she had remedied her mistake and began to look through an afternoon paper she had bought there seemed nothing better to do during the evening than to go to the theatre glancing down the list of attractions she suddenly saw the name of ruth morton in large letters filled in a new feature play an american beauty opening at the grand theatre that night she at once made up her mind to go since yesterday her interest in miss morton had perceptibly increased and in spite of all richard had held her hand she was just finishing her dinner when a page came through the room calling her name she got up at once and followed him to the lobby i am mrs duval she said the boy looked up there's a chauffeur outside wants to see you ma'am he said tom leary grace understood at once and made her way to the sidewalk the cab driver of the morning stood near the entrance i beg pardon ma'am for calling you out he said but i couldn't come in and there was something i felt you ought to know what is it a lady came here to see me a while ago he said smallish-looking woman not pretty with light hair she had on a dark brown suit not very good style ma'am she asked me if i knew anybody in the hotel named duval i said i did i find she'd been asking all the other cabmen and had been to the desk before that i guess she must have been inquiring for your husband ma'am yes yes very likely grace hastily replied what then well ma'am she then asked me if i knew mrs duval i said i did then she wanted to know if i'd driven either you or your husband to any other hotel to-day and i said i hadn't but that i usually did drive you when you went anywhere i took liberty of saying that ma'am 
Yes, I'm glad you did. Go on. Then she hands me five dollars and says that if I did drive you to any other hotel, I was to let her know which one it was. Where? Grace asked eagerly. The man fished from his pocket a small bit of cardboard, upon which was scrawled with a pencil. Alice Watson, General Delivery. Grace stared at the bit of paper in surprise. Had she, by some lucky chance, discovered the very person for whom Richard was seeking? Of course the name was probably a fictitious one, and the address general delivery meant nothing, and yet it provided a clue by means of which this woman might be found. "'You have acted very wisely, Leary,' she said. "'I am greatly obliged to you.' Do you want me to send her any word, ma'am? I may. I am anxious to get hold of this woman. Or, to be more exact, my husband is. I will consult with him first, however. It may be that he will want you to write her a letter, giving her some such information as she desires, and then, by going to the general delivery window at the post office, and watching, identify her when she comes for it. Do you think you could arrange to get off and do this? Well, ma'am, even if I can't arrange to get off, you could, of course, hire my cab and— Of course, Grace interrupted. Very well. I will let you know further about the matter a little later. Meanwhile, here is something more for your trouble. She gave the man another bill. Now drive me to the Grand Theatre. End of chapter 9《Of the Film of Fear》by Arnold Fredericks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Duval, after having satisfied himself that Ruth Morton was safely installed in her suite of rooms at the hotel, came down to the lobby to await the arrival of Mrs. Morton. The unexpected meeting with Grace caused him the utmost anxiety. He appreciated fully her reasons for having come to see him, and yet he deeply regretted her coming. The enemies of Ruth Morton were far too clever, too shrewd, he feared, not to take advantage of her mistake, and by means of it trace him at once to his present address. A complete disguise became an immediate necessity. He decided to assume one as soon as Mrs. Morton had arrived. The latter came in about ten minutes later, accompanied by Nora. Duval explained matters to the clerk at the desk, and the supposed Mrs. Bradley was conducted to her rooms at once. Duval accompanied her. They found Ruth resting quietly, but her joy at her mother's arrival was very apparent. She feared to be left alone, and seemed to expect her persecutors to appear from every closet through every door or window. Oh, mother, I'm so glad to see you, she exclaimed. I'm glad to find you safe, Mrs. Morton returned. I advise you to stay right here with your daughter throughout the evening, Mrs. Morton, said Duval as he made ready to go to his own room. Have your meals sent up. Admit no one. Open no packages. I have every hope that before the night is over... I may have some most important and satisfactory news for you. I shall probably not see you again until after the performance tonight. But if anything vital occurs, I will of course communicate with you by telephone. Goodbye, and good luck. When he reached his own room, he proceeded to the business of divesting himself completely of all resemblance to Richard Duval. It was clear that the persons he was seeking knew him by sight, and hence his opportunities to accomplish anything against them were very greatly lessened. The threatening telephone message received by Grace did not worry him at all, but the fact that those people were so constantly upon his heels did. He determined to disappear completely as Duval, and reappear in the person of John Bradley using all his skill in the matter of disguise, to create for himself a totally different personality. Taking a makeup box from his grip, he proceeded first to give his dark brown hair a very decided 
and natural-looking touch of grey over the temples and at the sides then he fitted into place a short pointed greyish beard and a moustache with waxed ends these were products of the skill of one of the best wig makers in paris and so cleverly made that they would defy detection even in broad daylight a pair of gold-rimmed eyeglasses completed the facial disguise duval might now have passed anywhere for a well-groomed professional man of fifty-five or sixty the impression was heightened by his frock coat and silk hat he felt quite sure that in his present disguise the plotters against ruth morton's welfare could not possibly recognize him he went down to the theatre very early after a hasty dinner and found mr baker in the box office the moving picture man did not recognize him of course and duval after drawing him aside had some little difficulty in convincing him of his identity once it had been established however mr baker conducted him to a dressing-room behind the scenes and motioned him to a chair we can talk here without being seen or heard he said is there anything new <sighs> nothing i have taken mrs morton and her daughter to a hotel where i feel sure they will be quite safe from further annoyance ruth will not come to the studio for a few days until we have gotten to the bottom of this affair i am staying in an adjoining room so as to be on hand at once in case of any trouble i suppose you have everything fixed for tonight yes mr baker's tone was dubious i have inserted in the film the material you gave me it will appear just at the end of part one i hope it will not spoil our picture i think not as a matter of fact when the reasons for its introduction become known i imagine it will give you a lot of very valuable advertising possibly so mr baker granted but after all i begin to feel very doubtful as to the results this woman whoever she is that is persecuting miss morton seems to be mighty clever she may not be affected in the way you think by what she sees on the screen i realize that it is only a chance but don't you think that under the circumstances it is a chance worth taking most certainly otherwise i should not have consented to it but as i say i doubt very much its success well we can only try you will remember what i said about the lights and the call for a doctor if one appears to be needed yes i have all that in mind miss morton is not coming tonight i presume no i advised against it i'm glad of that duval sat in silence for a moment by the way he said presently there is one important matter that i have overlooked do you give your employees passes for these opening performances no not regularly that is but any member of our organization who wishes to see the performance would of course be admitted we reserve a section of the house for that purpose a number of our people usually come over oh, good that's just what i had hoped for where is this section the last five rows on the left-hand side of the house but why don't you see all the evidence points to the fact that the person who is responsible for these threats either works in your studio or is in some way able to gain access to it at any time witness the stolen photograph the substituted telegram of this morning in the latter it was definitely stated that the woman in the case would be in the audience tonight i am hoping sincerely that you will not have the cleverness to enter as one of the public but will come in as one of your people and sit in the section of the house reserved exclusively for your employees in that event i think we shall discover who she is beyond a doubt i certainly hope so sighed mr baker this thing has got us all up in the air our president had a long conference with me this afternoon about miss morton he seems to think she is going to pieces and recommended trying to get joan clayton away from the multigraph people to take her place 
he says that she is losing her good looks i told him nothing of course but it worried me a lot i am very fond of ruth morton and i don't want to see her lose her place she won't lose it asserted duval when we get through her position with your company will be stronger than it has ever been before shall we go out in the lobby and take a look at the crowd as it comes in mr baker assented and the two men stationed themselves near the box office without appearing to do so duval inspected the various members of the incoming crowd his scrutiny was careful comprehensive but the only person he recognized was grace that she also recognized him he knew she had seen the disguise he wore many times and was familiar with it she did not betray herself however by so much as a glance but proceeded at once to her seat when the moment arrived for the beginning of the performance the house was filled duval with baker at his side stationed himself back of the left-hand section of seats so that the rows reserved for the employees of the company were directly in front of him he occupied himself during the interval before the lights were switched off by noting carefully all the women in the last five rows but none of them attracted his attention particularly soon the performance began ruth morton the american beauty stepped upon the screen a compelling vision of loveliness the audience followed eagerly her exciting adventures duval himself in spite of his preoccupation found himself absorbed by the charm and action of the picture in the opening scenes ruth appeared as a poor girl trying to make her way in the great world of the theatre her struggles her sacrifices her failures were almost vividly portrayed when at last through her marvellous beauty she succeeded in gaining recognition from the critics he applauded with those about him completely under the spell of her charm the final scene of the first part was a view of ruth as catherine gray the american beauty refusing the dubious offers made her by a rich new yorker with a faith in herself by no means assumed catherine turned from his picture of luxury of steam yachts of country estates of unlimited bank accounts with a smile which showed her confidence in her beauty her talents the audience watched her spellbound as she stood on the sidewalk before the theatre looking with grave inscrutable eyes after the costly limousine that had just driven away without her in no picture heretofore taken of the girl had she appeared to better advantage every line of her lovely face seemed responsive to the effect of the lighting the situation the motives which inspired her the audience drew itself back ready to register its approval of the first part of the film with hearty applause and then something happened the lovely smiling face of ruth morton faded from view and in its place came with brutal suddenness the picture of a huge grinning death's head amazing in its suggestion of horror the audience sat in utter silence wondering what could be the reason for this sudden apparition beneath the death's head appeared in huge letters the words we know the woman the thing had come as a complete surprise the tension throughout the house was electric duval saw his wife rise from her seat on the aisle a few rows away and come quickly to the rear of the house she at least realized that a moment of importance had arrived and then without warning the stillness of the theatre was broken by a sudden cry and a woman sitting some three rows from where duval stood but on the opposite side of the aisle from the seats indicated by mr baker rose to her feet turned and fell heavily against the back of the seat ahead of her at almost the same moment the lights were switched on and a voice was heard calling is there a doctor in the house 
it was mr baker and duval who stood beside him sprang forward at once i'm a doctor he cried and approached the place where the woman sat can i be of any assistance grace asked i am a trained nurse yes replied duval quickly get this woman to the ladies dressing room at once grace sprang forward there was a bustle among the audience a sudden rising a craning of necks everyone seemed to be looking for the person who had uttered the sudden cry before anyone fully realized what had happened grace had reached the fainting woman's side and supporting her with an arm about her waist was leading her toward the rear of the house almost at once the theatre became dark and the second part of the picture was flashed upon the screen the lovely face of ruth morton once more greeted the eyes of the audience the interruption had occupied less than a minute duval standing at the entrance to the aisle watched grace come quickly toward him supporting the fainting woman the latter seemed completely overcome and grace was obliged almost to carry her keep her there in the dressing-room until i return he said in a quick whisper then with a nod to mr baker who stood close by he went toward the street a taxicab drew up awaiting a fare duval signalled to it wait for me here he said to the driver i will be back in a moment then he re-entered the theatre grace meanwhile had conducted the woman to the ladies dressing-room and placed her upon a couch she was a frail insignificant-looking creature not at all the sort of person one would associate with threats of the kind that ruth morton had been receiving she appeared to be greatly ashamed of her sudden collapse and kept insisting in spite of her evident weakness that she was quite all right again and wanted to go grace however paid no attention to her protestations but insisted that she remain quiet the doctor will be here in a moment she said you must wait quietly until he comes the woman however seemed determined to leave and it was with a sigh of relief that grace welcomed her husband's return duval came in hurriedly as he did so taking a small brown bottle from his waistcoat pocket give me a glass of water he said to the negro maid the woman brought one at once duval took a tablet from the bottle and placed it in the glass stirring the water about with the end of a lead pencil until the tablet was dissolved then he went up to the woman on the couch here drink this he commanded it will quiet your nerves the woman took the glass her eyes regarding him with suspicion duval in his character of a physician turned aside and addressed a few words to grace fearing that in some way the woman might succeed in recognizing him as a result both failed to see that instead of drinking the medicine he had given to her the girl swiftly poured it upon the floor when he again turned to her she held the empty glass in her hand duval took it from her and handed it to grace come with me miss he said i will see you home it isn't necessary the woman gasped i i'm all right now you have had a severe shock miss as a physician it is my duty to see that you arrive home safely i have already engaged a cab come he took the woman by the arm and in spite of her objections raised her from the couch suddenly her opposition vanished she seemed glad of his assistance and leaning on his arm made her way from the theatre duval was in high spirits he fully believed that his plan had succeeded that the woman at his side was the one who was responsible for the threats which had made ruth morton so wretched for the past few days the cab that he had engaged stood waiting at the door he put the woman inside she seemed very weak and helpless drive to the hotel duval called to the chauffeur then entered the cab and seated himself at the woman's side 
he saw Mr. Baker standing upon the sidewalk and nodded. Then they drove off. The woman lay in a state of apparent collapse in one corner of the cab, her face pale, her eyes closed. Duval, inspecting her as well as he could in the faint light, began to feel grave doubts as to whether, after all, he had been successful in his ruse. She seemed so little the type of woman he would have associated with the brutal campaign of terror that had been directed against Miss Morton. She clutched a black leather satchel tightly in one hand. Duval regarded it with interest. If he was right in his assumption that this was the woman he sought, it seemed highly probable that within that satchel lay evidence that might convict her. At least there would be some clue as to who she was, and that in itself would be valuable. The woman seemed to grow weaker and weaker. Her closed eyes, her slow but regular breathing, indicated that the drug he had given her had begun to take effect. Stealthily Duval's hand reached toward the small black satchel. With eager fingers he pressed the catch, and as the bag opened, began to draw out its contents. The woman, however, seemed far less helpless than he had supposed. She pulled the satchel toward her, her fingers seeking to close it. Duval discontinued his efforts at once. It would be time enough, he felt, when they had reached the hotel, and the woman had been safely conducted to a room there. He had made his plans carefully in advance, and arranged matters with the hotel manager. There was nothing to do now but wait. Presently the woman, who had been regarding him, unnoticed, from beneath lowered lids, uttered a groan, as though in great pain, and clutched her breast. Duval turned to her at once, speaking in a soothing voice, and assuming a professional manner. Is anything wrong, miss? I had hoped you were feeling better. No, doctor, I'm not. I feel terrible. Terrible. In what way? My, my heart. It is in awful shape. I need some stimulant. The, the medicine you gave me made me feel very ill. Her words surprised Duval. He had given her a simple drug, the effect of which should have been to make her drowsy, to quiet her nerves. That she had not taken it, he, of course, did not know. His greatest fear had been that she would refuse to enter the cab with him. Now that she had done so, he was prepared to use even force, if necessary, to retain her in his custody, until he had either obtained the evidence he desired, or forced from her a confession. What he particularly hoped to find was the seal with which the death's head impression had been made. He felt certain that, if this was the woman he sought, she would have this seal somewhere about her person. It was far too significant a bit of evidence to be left lying about at home. But there was always the chance that this woman, who had been so instantly affected by the ghastly apparition on the screen, the significant words beneath it, might not, after all, be the right one, the one he sought. There was always the possibility that the real criminal, although present in the audience, had made no sign, and that his companion in the cab might be entirely innocent. As he had told Baker, it was a chance, a long chance. Yet something seemed to say to him, that he had made no mistake in taking it. Now, however, a new situation had arisen to upset his plans. His prisoner, instead of having been quieted by the drug he had administered, was apparently becoming more and more agitated and nervous every minute. Her groans, as she lay huddled up in the corner of the cab, puzzled him, filled him with vague alarm. Was it possible that she had a weak heart? Had the sedative he had given her, harmless as he knew the dose would be to a normal person, affected her in so unfavorable a way? He took her wrist in his hand and felt her pulse. It was quick, indicative of nervous excitement, but certainly not weak. Oh, 
Doctor, doctor, won't you please give me something to make me feel a little better? The woman gasped. It's my heart, I tell you. I—I I can't breathe. I'm suffocating. I must have something at once. Some aromatic spirits of ammonia. Some brandy. Anything to make me feel a little better. Her earnestness, her trembling voice, her excited manner, all served to convince Duval that his companion was really in need of a stimulant of some sort. He decided to humor her. A dose of aromatic spirits, he reflected, could do no harm, and would doubtless serve to lessen her excitement. He leaned out and directed the driver of the cab to stop at the nearest drug store. Oh, thank you, thank you, the woman gasped. Tell him to hurry, please. Then, collapsing in the corner of the seat, she closed her eyes, and sat so silent that Duval began to wonder whether she had lost consciousness. The taxicab, meanwhile, had drawn up in front of a drugstore on Sixth Avenue. Duval took a look at the apparently unconscious woman, then spoke quickly to the chauffeur. "'Stay here until I return,' he said. "'Don't go away under any circumstances.' I shall be gone but a moment. The man nodded. I'll stay, sir, he said. Don't worry. Duval went quickly into the store. Going up to the soda counter, he instructed the clerk to prepare him a dose of aromatic spirits of ammonia as quickly as possible. While waiting for it, he watched the cab through the store window. The preparation of the dose required but a few moments. Then, explaining matters to the clerk, Duval took the glass in his hand and went back to the cab. He smiled to himself at his anxiety as he passed through the door. The woman was far too ill, he reflected, to entertain any thoughts of escape. Here, the detective said, opening the door of the cab. Drink this. There was no response. Duval stuck his head into the vehicle with some misgivings. Then he experienced a sudden and most mortifying shock. There was no fainting woman huddled against the cushions in the far corner. There was no woman at all. The cab was empty. End of chapter 10